Wow. Okay. Hi everyone, that? welcome to the broiler. Um, it's great to see everyone. And it's great also to have air conditioning, which is a new thing that happened since last time I was here. Yay! <laughs> um, uh, James has asked me to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones. So take a minute to shuffle around and do that. And I'll stand here awkwardly. <laughs> um, my name's Anna Ross. I am a long time patron and fan of the Grolier and a poet myself, um, but I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to talk about three really wonderful poets um, who we're gonna hear from tonight, all reading from wonderful books, which we have here displayed and also more at the counter. Um, so we're gonna be hearing um, in order um, from Miko Harvey, Shelley Wong, and Darcy oh. Dennigan. Um, and I'm just gonna introduce all of them at the same time um, so that I'm not like a puppet coming up and down here. Um, uh, so bear with me, but um, let's start with Miko. According to the Boston Globe, the animals in Miko Harvey's poems are the outside ones, the actual oh, walruses, penguins, ladybugs, and the inside ones, the ones that make our hearts beat faster, that hunger and long and fear. In his smart-hearted and spirited new collection, Let World Have You, House of Anasa, Anansi, sorry, Harvey writes poems as stories, as fairy tales, as fabulous moments with reality on slant. To this, I'll add that his poems disarm us with their velocity of language, their virtuosic lists that lead us from that ladybug to self-revelation. What was the name of that month where you stopped loving yourself before we quite know where we or who we are or what we've been doing, only that we are here. He is the author of Let the World Have You, House of Anansi 20, 2022, and Unstable Neighborhood Rabbit, House of Anansi 2018. He's a graduate of Cambridge Ringe and Latin nearby, <laughs> Vassar College, yeah, and Cambridge Ringe and Latin, um, Vassar College and The Ohio State University. And he's received the RBC Penn Canada New Voices Award, the McCrindle Foundation Editorial Fellowship from Poets and Writers magazine and fellowships from McDowell and Yaddo. He currently lives in Western Massachusetts. Um, Shelley Wong's poems often contain instructions or warnings for existing in a world in which the rules have been constructed to favor others. How does a rhyme determine fate? Daughter, laughter, slaughter. I write to re-envision the world and explore possibilities of being and becoming, to test my freedom within the field of the page. I write a poem with the hope that a reader will one day close the space and affirm its presence, she tells us in the Kenyan Review. And this freedom is capacious and inviting and freighted with history that continually calls to our present. Containing Beyonce, Lucy Liu, skunk cabbages, the tides, Tegan and Sarah, the pulse night could massacre, orgasms of glitter spilled over the Hudson. She's the author of As She Appears, Yes, Yes Books, 2022, winner of the 2019 Palmette River Prize, and her poems have appeared in the American Poetry Review, Best American Poetry, Kenyan Review, and New England Review. She's a recipient of the Pushcart Prize and fellowships from Kundiman and McDowell. She holds an MFA from The Ohio State University and lives in San Francisco. Um, and Darcy Jennigan, um, aside from being an excellent parking assistant, um, <laughs> writes poems that contain linguistic tales in which characters, modes, moods, and actions often seem dictated by the sounds and syllables of her language because precipices, but because precipice contains ice practically twice because I wanted teetering. The poems can feel like Joseph Cornell boxes or carefully constructed rooms in which the sets are always shifting, catching us off guard. She is also a playwright where her sets become literal, and she is the recipient of the 2020 Howard Foundation Fellowship in Playwriting from Brown University. She's the author of five books, including Madam X, Canarium, and Slater Orchard, and Etymology. And her awards include the 2019 Anna Rabinowitz Award from the Poetry Society of America for, quote, Venture, venturesome interdisciplinary work a Discovery of the Nation Prize, the Cecil Hemley Award from the Poetry Society of America, and a Rhode Island State Council of the Arts Poetry Fellowship. She's an associate professor in residence at University of Connecticut, and a co-founder of and teacher for Frequency Writers, a writing community for Providence and Beyond, based in Providence, Rhode Island, where she lives. Um, so a big round of applause for all of our poets. <laughs> Oh, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Anna, for that introduction. Um, hello, Zoom. Um, it's so great to be here. This is my first time reading in Cambridge, where I grew up, uh, and also my first time mostly reading in front of my family. So that makes it extra special. I've got the first couple of rows here. Um, and it's extra, extra special to be in the Grolier, which I was telling James, I, I've been coming here since high school, um, just kind of browsing and imagining what it would feel like to have a book of my own as I looked through these books. And now I have this book, um, which I will read from. So I want to start with this poem called Field Trip because I have uh, two uncles in attendance and this poem mentions an uncle. Um, I think it's pretty clearly not based on either of you, but <laughs> I find it great kind of to imagine you as this uncle. So this is for my uncles. Field trip. Calling all scared people. We're going to pick chanterelles now. Plus, I wouldn't mind playing some trivia along the way. I felt so out of place in the gently used women's clothing shop on Court Street, but then my separate no separateness became this nook I grew to love. An old woman whistled super faintly as she shuffled through blouses, and the noise trickled deep into my brain, a kind of tonic. I'd like to make that noise for somebody <clears throat> just once. Lately, I've been hoarding wildness in hopes of funding a rocket to grace. I know, I know, it's not gonna happen. The only way to truly level up in terms of the spirit is to start gardening. My partner said several devastating words to me in the taxi. I stared at the haystacks. I remembered my uncle. He was the type of man who maintain eye contact with you even as, as he picked a live moth off the wall and nibbled on its wings. Lately, I've been whispering my secrets into jars. Things can be pushed away by inviting them closer. We understand this even if the others don't, which is why I have always loved the tiniest windows most. Um, so several poems in this book kind of take the form of stories, um, short stories, kind of surreal, magical little stories. Um, and I'm going to read a few of those. Uh, I especially like to read them because I feel less like exposed reading them because they're fictional. Um, but I will eventually circle back to some poetic type poems. Uh, afterwards. This first one is called um, I actually think I'm going to read them without their titles because I think as an experiment I think they all kind of live in the same little world and I want to see how they function like that. The town needed a new mayor. As usual no one wanted to do it my severe anxiety makes me a poor candidate, said one woman. Oh, please, said a man. That's nothing. I am literally a psychopath. <laughs> the meeting had reached an impasse. So be it, announced the eldest librarian. Bring out Harold. The glass cage containing the small yellow lizard was fetched from its official chamber. The librarian removed the lid and turned the cage onto its side, allowing Harold to step into the light. The crowd fell silent in the presence of a cousin consciousness. For 10 seconds, Harold stood motionless. I glanced at Angelica, who was staring fixedly at the lizard. The stakes were high for her. I knew that, and her furrowed brow betrayed it. I stared at Harold too, directly into his dark, indecipherable eyes. He pivoted, took one step to his left, then paused. Would he pick Delmore, as had long been speculated? A whole tense minute passed like this, 
during which he seemed to be gazing at all of us at once. And not just at us, but also at our children, our decisions, and all of the awful music we had allowed to grow popular. <laughs> Without warning, Harold turned and ran back into his cage. We rejoiced, even as the librarian began to weep. Of course, we understood what this meant. We were free now to destroy ourselves in peace. I like how in moments of silence, there's a ticking of a clock here, <laughs> which really worked for that poem. Probably can't hear that on Zoom. I'm not a man, he said. I'm a deeply ironic houseplant. <laughs> and when I looked closely, more closely than I had ever looked, I found this to be true. He was a houseplant. What about our relationship, I said. <laughs> but his leaves just gleamed in the flat evening light. Can I at least count on you to protect my secrets, I said things I told you when I thought we were together, but his leaves just gleamed arrogantly. I can't believe this is happening to me again, I thought, <laughs> as I fetched my little pair of scissors and began to snip his leaves off, cutting him up just to be sure he would never tell anybody. This was before even my little scissors betrayed me. The baker at the farmer's market handed me a loaf of what she called the best bread in the world. Take a slice of this, she said, spread some real butter on it and thank me later. What haunts me is the way she lowered her voice as she arrived at the phrase, real butter. I forgot to do that when I read the first line of dialogue. <laughs> um, no doubt she only meant real in contrast to vegan substitutes which as a baker, she perhaps felt were corrupting the very notion of butter. Still, how could she be so sure I would be her comrade in this struggle? Perhaps it had something to do with my face, some aspect that when looked upon closely as only bakers and farmers and other such stewards of the earth can look, revealed a certain, but never mind. My arrogance is not relevant to this matter. What is relevant, is the feeling I get when I smear butter on this bread. The butter, rather than the bread it was meant to complement, has become the central event. By turning the key of a single word, the baker reversed the ritual, introducing me to a kind of conspiracy, and not the banal dairy agenda for which I'd initially mistaken it, but rather the conspiracy lurking underneath that conspiracy. The butter was real all along. Its realness had simply been lost on me, lost in the forest between experience and my face. The next time I went to the market, I saw the baker wearing her worn bandana and thought these thoughts, although I could not say them. You were right about the real butter and thank you, by the way, for introducing me to the conspiracy underneath the conspiracy. Such a crass statement would surely bar me in her eyes from the ranks of the real to which she had previously assigned me. So I kept my mouth shut. I bought more bread. I also bought eggs, radishes, kale, and a zucchini because I know how to play this game. <laughs> I may not be a natural, but with great effort, I'm nonetheless able to move my game piece steadily across the board. Okay, take a deep breath, drink some water, and take a look. Um, okay, I will read this poem 4M, which is for my sister, who is here, amazingly, as well. 4M, I don't want you to be nervous. 
Maybe thinking of a walrus would help. Have you seen a video of the penguin accidentally stepping on a sleeping walrus? It thought it was a rock. The walrus wakes up like, what the fuck? And the penguin squirt scurries off like, oh shit. <laughs> Sometimes it's funny watching a surprise happen. And not just funny, but kind of amazing. Like you never really know what's what when it comes to this planet. Then again, when it's you getting surprised, that's different especially for tender ones like us. What are we supposed to do? It's bad for our hearts, you know. I hope you won't need pills like I do. I think I get so scared because I'm greedy. I want to hold on to everything. The world wants to take it away. What the fuck? The number of hours we have together is actually not so large. Please linger near the door uncomfortably instead of just leaving. Please forget your scarf in my life and come back later for it. Okay. My father requested this poem, Fly Flying Into a Mirror. This one I will read next. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm gonna read another different poem first. I thought this would be a good self-loathing poem to read in front of my family. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Funny Business. <sighs> I wonder if later I will forgive myself for having denied my loved ones demonstrations of my loving them. I was too busy demonstrating myself to the universe. I was too busy turning strangers into sites of worship. I was so, so busy considering the symbolism of the fish's boiled eyeball as it sat there on the platter. I was feeling uncomfortable in the presence of the wide smile of the holographic customer service associate. I Googled what delphiniums are. I took my shirt off and rolled around in the yard pretending to be a little worm. Well, actual worms were rolling around in the yard and I actually crushed one to death. Okay, now I'll read the other one. <clears throat> Fly flying into a mirror. <clears throat> and I mentioned lists in your intro. So this is my list poem contribution to validate you. Thank you. No warfage. No soft edges, no more ice cubes or chances to be normal. Nothing left of the landscape that's photographable. No imaginary friends seated at the dining room table and certainly no soup there, no fish in the river, no miracles arriving in the form of phone calls, no signs warning children of the dangers of falling from windows, no muscular sailors who happen to be passing by to catch the children as they fall. No sailors at all, no boats or water, no gum wrappers left to fold into smaller and denser arrangements, no faded bronze plaques inscribed with history lessons, no history, no ability to silence the advertisements. Are there some places where love simply doesn't grow as fast as it decays? And by places, I mean people, and when you fall asleep is when I need you most desperately because without your eyes on it, this whole town disappears. Um, so um, Shelley Wong and Darcy Dannegan are two of my very favorite poets. Where did Darcy go? Oh, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's really, really special to read with both of you. And um, I met Shelley in grad school. We have an Ohio State contingent here. Um, and while I was at Ohio State, I took a class with Kathy Fagan, who may or may not be in this little black circle looking at me, I'm not sure. And we read Darcy Dennigan's poems in that class. Um, 
which is where I first encountered them and loved them and uh, have loved them ever since. So yeah, she's, they're both, you've got good things coming your way after I sit down in a minute. Um, this last poem is called The Frontiers Women. It turned out that the cause of her memory loss was a family of microscopic women who had burrowed into the frontal lobe of her brain, hollowed out a tiny portion and taken up residence there. A CAT scan revealed this clearly. Before she could really process what she had just heard, the doctor began narrating over a slideshow of images. So as you can see, there are four tiny people living in the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> of the four, two are particularly small. They seem to be children, little girls. They pass the time playing various physical games, tag and such. The girls have two mother figures, one of whom spends all day slicing bits of meat off of the brain wall. And when her hands are full, she calls over her daughters who then eat the meat out of her hands. The other mother seems to have more of a maintenance or landscaping role. And that's basically it. That's how they live hour after hour, as far as I can tell. The patient was speechless, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The doctor said, you want to hear the prognosis, of course. Well, as you've noticed, there has been some disruption to your working memory, your mood, perhaps the structure of your sleep. This is because during their initial migration into your brain, these tiny people, these frontiers women, if you will, traversed several neural pathways and left a narrow band of reduced activity in their wake, which you can see here in this gray matter. We'll certainly address those symptoms. However, the doctor continued, once again, turning to gaze upon the monochromatic images. At this point, the frontiers women seem to be going about their business rather sustainably. The pace at which the mother is slicing meat is so slow, the brain bits she is removing so infinitesimal that your symptoms most likely will never get any worse. Of course, we'll monitor you carefully to make sure of this. A crow shrieked loudly enough to penetrate the window of the doctor's office through which sunshine was also silently penetrating. The patient studied the doctor's face studying the images. Now, there is a surgical option, he said, but surgery comes with significant risks. And what's more, any manual intervention would almost certainly result, result in the death of the frontiers women. Which brings us to another point. Although I do hate to lay this all on you at once, the doctor said, staring straight into the patient's eyes now. It is possible that these frontiers women are the only ones of their kind. If so, certain scientific concerns, as well as moral ones, I would argue, must be considered. Or, or perhaps not, perhaps there are other frontiers women in other brains, living in brains all over the world. That would be so awesome, the doctor said, <laughs> unable to quite control himself. It might even finally signal the beginning of the revolution, he said, veering wildly off course now, although his voice remained calm as ever. Thank you all. You all for being here on a Friday night. Um, 
of them just text. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, James and Goyer team for having us. Um, thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you to all those in the Zoom room. Um, also shout out to um, Jennifer and my publicist for all their coordination. Um, it's really special to be here reading with Nico and Darcy. Um, uh, Kathy shared um, Darcy's poems, um, the new song of songs in her free verse, uh, I think it's her free verse workshop and I loved it. And um, I bought the first um, book and I saw there's one copy on the shelf. Um, Crinoline um, Apocalypse. And um, then I also was in touch with Darcy um, for work for the journal. And then three years later, being able to share um, the love of Darcy's work with Nico and be in the same reverse workshop together is like a beautiful circle. Um, Can you speak a little louder? Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Sure. So this is my debut collection, As She Appears, um, and yeah, it's, it's been like a decade in the coming, so I'm very happy to share it with you on the East Coast. This is the first poem in the book. For the living in the new world. There are so many ways to explore a forest over clover clusters, past skunk cabbages, to a field where we listen for a ghost of song. The hypergreen periphery is the opposite of Los Angeles on fire. Any tree can become a ladder. These trees have too many branches, but it is not my place to revise them. I may be happiest improvising the language a body can make on a dance floor. We are just learning how female birds sing in the tropics. Spring insists we can build the world around us again. How has love brought you here? My head is heavy from the crown. Um, so in this collection, I'm thinking about um, the poems I wanted to have as a younger um, person and, and also kind of enacting my own coming into becoming a poet, um, thinking a lot about um, the spaces where um, queer women of color do not appear and how women are represented or not represented and writing a space of becoming and gathering. And so a sort of journeys through time and landscapes and art spaces and song and film and um, dances. Um, so this poem is called Private Collection. At the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the ocean drawn in pencil is no longer on display. I once thought I could wreck that water. My partner liked the painting of a blonde woman reading a newspaper, a sister to a Dutch painting I admired back in New York, where a woman contemplates a water pitcher in cathedral light. We walked gallery to gallery and no women resembled us. I'm charmed by certain French words, but forget what they mean and never properly pronounce them. Melange, de rigueur, en curant. Sometimes couples become echoes of one another. We wore quiet glasses, our hair and low ponytails like George Washington. She would photograph me when I looked away from her as I glanced at the curves of the Grand Tetons, the raised head of the Greek caryatid locked in the British Museum, a winter forest floor somewhere in Oregon when we were 19 and I couldn't meet the camera's gaze. So I knew she was there and that she would hold me from a distance. And what a 
remember to hydrate. <laughs> Um, a core series that came together in this book um, takes place on Fire Island, which is a barrier island below Long Island. And it's um, um, really a year round, um, but primarily summer destination for um, the LGBTQ community. And I spent some time there when I lived in New York with my partner at the time, and then returned as an artist in residence for the national parks, um, which is pretty nice. I got my own ranger house, it was like four bedrooms, it was Memorial Day weekend. Um, yeah, so those poems became, I think, the heart of this collection. And this is the first one. Department of the Interior. The tide calls the water of the body Fire Island spans 32 miles and is drifting west. A maze cuts through the salt marsh, bridging bay to ocean. Where I wander is federal land, not a branch interlude of neon pool parties. I'm part of the sky paparazzi, dazed by its flaring, rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. Stumbling in the sand, I find only the crash of return. I have come to this barrier island again in the silence that follows a separation. Tomorrow there will be three boats at various distances, one jet ski, lightning like a rumor of another realm. I try to divide 11 years but cannot be held to exactness. My mind floats out to water and I am living through this world once. Refrain. Farewell, romantic sacrifice. I choose myself. Some can only love once. How true will it be? I love sequins, but get the sequence confused. At our end, I broke from her, and every face grew stranger. Stranger speaks to me like light through a veil. Like a spent match, the darlings turn to find me, and I fade into the glitter. A sequoia has every vowel, every vowel like a closed hand. When I've worn my body down from dancing, I still point to the sky. I will honor my body, my only, my only body, its honor, my will. I'm going, to be, I'm going to read an oldie <laughs> that I don't usually read. Um, uh, shout out to Kathy Fagan's free verse workshop. Um, I just also want to give love to Nick White and Becca Turkowitz. <laughs> my, well, two of my favorite prose MFAers um, and beloveds. Um, yeah. So this is an Ohio-born poem. Exit strategist. A quarrel in white. In war, low light, the women don't know who to turn to. Veil of splitting leaves, veil soaked in rosé, fluorescent veil for kicks. Pine tree shadows approach. You're my witness. The dirty perfume we trample. Stack baskets with too many arrows. My sword crossed yours. I win, I win. Don't touch the trees. Don't clap three times. All the pretty moths represent. One bird, one way out. Is this a game? Broken bridge, says the banner man. I hold a dead lighter and the good book of knots. Like a long apple peel, she goes by. These arts I invented so he could not refuse me. A bowl full of fish writhing in place. Out over the water, I walk the plank. I'm off the ship. 
So in that poem at the end, I'm thinking about um, sort of recasting Wendy mm -hmm. in Peter Pan and I had like this very sheltered childhood where I grew up in the 80s, so it was like old Disney. <laughs> it was like pretty dark. <laughs> and today I just like, just Googled that moment when Wendy walks the plank. I'm like, this is not okay for children. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was like, oh yeah, still haunted by Wendy walking the plank. So yeah, I think in all stories I'm looking for um, the girls, the women and their stories. Um, and thinking about women in the world um, and women outside of the domestic and women in, in nature, because um, there aren't a lot of um, queer women in nature. Um, so picking up on the Fire Island um, journey. So the National Parks residency is in the straight part of Fire Island, which is the Eastern part. And like the queer part is like two miles away. And like once I did like walk in the sand, which was like a bad idea. And so the second time I was gonna take the ferry, but um, I was thwarted. This is about that journey. Weather advisory. It is foggy and the ferry will not travel east. The captain lost without his radar, sonar. Excuse me, sirs, this is a gay dancing emergency. <laughs> is heterosexuality the fog? <laughs> I am slow with too much time, dressed in four shades of gray and a streak of pink. Oh, it's an older crowd. Oh, that's me. We all had the same Madonna Whitney childhood set to synthesizer beats. Today, I tried to pluck a pine cone, but the stem said no. I'm sorry, tree, I meant to ask consent. Between the pines and cherry grove, there is one path for tourists, another for cruising. Among the rangers, I feel famous. Are you the writer? Hello, bird. I have no sweetness to offer the bees. Where did Frank O'Hara wander and fall asleep on the beach? The first inhabitant of Fire Island was a shipwrecker. He lured ships to shore and killed the crews. It is not certain whether the island is named for these warning flames or its sunsets. I am a fire sign. Who should I touch with this burning? I loop along the bay, the marina, the beach, emptied of families. In the straight neighborhood, I watch men on break, pause one by one to take in my neon floral shorts. They reveal my kiss of a birthmark, the walk of a messy haired woman, some far away flower. Need two more. This one's about um, dating in the Bay Area. <laughs> Pursuit. What did you buy for me in Connecticut? A small, strange gift you wrote. We met at a lakeside retreat. You were perpetually emo, but the voice like a struck match. In your black t-shirt, you would lose your sulk if I glanced at you too long. You had raccoon eyeliner in a dangling chain wallet like a Hot Topic teen. In your notebook, you wrote, where do I put this lust? Because you had a woman and still listened for when I stepped out of the pool at night. Back in the city over brunch, I said, okay, when you told me you didn't identify as a woman and I meant to ask, what pronouns you used. I got lost in your swirled hair. You invited me to a party and arrived with a new woman, younger than us. I took a selfie with your teacup dog. How many women did you walk through to reach me? 
You refuse to dance, but I would not leave without joy, not after Orlando. Out of tired politeness, I danced with your date, who looked up at me, submissive and intent. Was it an audition? She said polyamory worked for her. Mormonism did not. My religion was that I didn't share. You kept drinking and I left early, sober. The last time I saw you, it was raining at a protest rally. We were strangers in the crowd. You had no umbrella and I did, and neither of us could move. So thank you all for being here and listening. Um, I'm gonna close, um, it's really a prose piece and not a prose poem. Um, this is the last piece, well, no. This is one of the, in terms of time, it's the last sort of add on piece and I kind of see it as a transition to book two and I wrote it um, in the spring of the first wave of the pandemic. It's um, now called Pandemic Spring. Golden Gate Park rises before me. I follow different paths because this is no time for order. What's new is the greater quiet, as if the world is echoing me. A tentative glance, no touching. Along the secret lake, I linger under a cherry tree in full blossom, as is my ancestral right. Something my Ohio friend once said to be about hunting in Virginia. When the, pot, when, when the petals fall like snow, I think all my karaoke dreams one male mallard duck chases another who chases another. Is this about love? Maybe the hidden female wants to be alone. A slow spring, loosening my mermaid hair. A siren splits the bird song. Hours of falling and listening. I've given up coffee to lighten my heart, but a knot remains. The cat taps my ankle to ask for a pet but not a hug, never a hug. Years ago, after the separation, I couldn't sense anything until the spring when a woman's song broke over me. The days are unspeakable. Color becomes a feeling, a spray of shocked orange poppies, tiny golden creeping buttercups, serene Chinese hibiscus. A great blue heron steps out of the grass. I wear pale pink to bloom, a pastel queen soft sight. There is a gentleness that returns once you let go of love's disappointment, a fleeting expanse in the compressed day. When only the birds are with me, I embrace a redwood tree, breathing it in. Dear ancestor, I'm always rapidly departing, forgive me to live I want to be known and loved, the two together, inseparable. Thank you. Okay. There's one thing I think I'm going to mispronounce. Um, <laughs> how do you pronounce that? I think he's Argentinian writer Cesar Aira, A I R A. I'm looking at you, fiction people. No. Okay. All right. Well, forgive me. Um, the gay dancing emergency. <laughs> Best line. Um, <laughs> and the frontiers woman in the brain is actually one of the most optimistic like worldviews I've heard in many years, many years. <laughs> I love it. Um, so happy to read with you guys. Thank you, Anna, for coming and doing this. Um, and I don't know if they're there, but I think my friend Farnoosh is on Zoom. So hi. And hi, Kathy. I would love to meet you someday. Um, and thank you, James and the Grolier, for facilitating this 
it's not where I grew up like Nico, but this is Cambridge is where I became a poet and first started writing poetry and I used to be too nervous to even come in here. I would just like peek and feel like I wasn't, you know, qualified or something. Um, and it's just like a dream, like a life dream to be in here. Um, so thanks. I'm going to read not poems um, because I haven't been able to write them lately, but I'm going to read something from a book I wrote last winter when I wish I were writing poems. And the book is called Eulogy and it's seven short pages for you. I am going very deeply into Providence. I'm glad to live in a city with a divine name because at certain times I'm quite caught up in earthly things and daily earthly things. The plastic bread bag drawing on the dish rack is eyeing me. It is asking me to fulfill it. It has held food, very nice bread, my favorite, and now it awaits its next purpose, cat excrement. <laughs> the bread bag has a very good life, assisting my household this week in eating and shitting. And it's lovely that the water I use to rinse the bag is Providence water. And the truck that will come to take my bin of bagged cat excrement is Providence trash. I don't always hear it that way, but sometimes I do. The brush of a warm hand picking us all up in its infinite palm. Huh, no, that sounds too pretty. And also, no, I do not hear that in the word Providence. Though I do feel linked to the people of this city. It is not a palm we sit in, more like we're crimped together over the same sewer system. I hear in Providence a little ting, a ting that pushes me out of the day. Ting, I hear tomorrow, tomorrow, what? I try to see it, what do I see? I see the word rampageous. That is the word for the life I want to live. I see the word and think the thought, and I also hear a laugh. It is the dry, short, and not unkind laugh of my friend who also lives in Providence. My friend laughs this way when I begin to have thoughts of greatness. The greatness of me in my apartment, hosting a party for certain great writers, not even the writers of my most beloved books, because if I were to meet those writers, and I have exactly twice, what I would wish would be a much different venue. In fact, I always think about this time I was at a little beach, a bay beach with a salt marsh and further out an expanse of tidal flats. And I was mucking around with kids and also with my sister and brother-in-law. The sand was wet and sulfury. Then the tide started coming in abruptly and fast and our legs sunk down further into the sand and our feet were really stuck and it was difficult to extract ourselves. We were all wearing shoes because that particular bay had broken oyster shells and live razor clams and it was very easy to cut one's feet. The shoes made extraction much more difficult. It's funny that I want to meet a beloved writer this way because I don't remember what happened next exactly. All I do remember is us about 20 minutes later walking back into town with very muddy shoes and legs, mud up to our knees, and that I had to leave a shoe behind. I hadn't wanted to, but the water was getting very deep and I could not retrieve it. What I do remember walking back to town is thinking, I like these people. I met my sister and brother-in-law. I thought even if they had been strangers to me there on that little beach, I would have liked them. There was the tide unexpectedly flooding the sand flat where we were all playing, us three and several non-swimming kids. And my sister and brother-in-law displayed a very good talent for lightness. That's what I noticed. They saw the danger and barked at the kids to move. And I could see the tragic scenario streaming through their minds. And yet also the whole time, they carried the danger on their heads as if it were the lightest of things. And afterwards walking back to town wet and muddy, the skin on the bottom of my one shoeless foot burning on the pavement, we told each other the story of the mud and the tide and they held the danger, which weighed quite a bit. The kids were young and outnumbered us and even a handful of that mud was very heavy. They held that danger even higher over their heads. Really what they did was lift it. They lifted the whole situation and stood underneath it, hands free and they laughed. I love when serious, anxious people, and that is they, work for lightness. I regretted then, though at that point did not learn to avoid, each heavy sentence I had ever written. The pavement, oh my God, it was so hot. I kept searching for a piece of shade to land my left foot in, but also I was happy to be searing the dry, ugly flesh of my foot bottom. I really was. It was my punishment for taking the easy way in writing and letting some things be heavy. You're such a wimp, I thought to myself, not all the time. Sometimes I can and do lift it, but it's an ongoing education and 
That's why I would like to be in danger alongside my most beloved, serious and anxious writers to study how they achieve lightness. A supplementary benefit of the danger element, it will act as an equalizer in my self-conscious brain so that I don't drench every casual remark with the word beloved, something I seem always to be on the verge of doing. So no, the writers I want at my literary party in my apartment in Providence are ones like Cesar Ira and Hilton Owls. As the host, I will be too busy washing wine glasses and taking coats to interact much, and that's fine. It's just that I feel the need to seek and connect with greatness. This is not the point at which my friend laughs. That need is something she understands. It's when I speak of greatness as if I did not and likely always will live in Providence. For example, when I say things like, uh, someday I too would like to have a pied a terre in, in Paris, like that poet we know. When I talk as if writing and living the literary life were the same thing, that's when she laughs. But the gods have put me in Providence and I must have greatness. That is a condition I bestow upon myself but as a quality of my teachers, I must cavort with great writers and artists so that I can lift heavier things. It matters not how old one is when one is a bit of a naive, and that I surely am. I will always be a bright faced little student, even well into senescence. With each book I read, I'm at least half a centimeter taller. The tent must continue to rise. So deeply into Providence I go. I am going. It is a question of working within the constraint, yes, the form of my life is the city. That is to say, the city is my container. Is there sun enough for me to grow as tall as I'd like? Sun shall come to me, has come, in the form of one, money enough to live in this relatively leafy neighborhood while working only one job so as to leave my brain some time and space for writing and two, proximity to greatness. Well, there is a rather royal couple of poets who live only six blocks away. I sometimes see them on walks and I breathe in the air that trails behind them. Oh yes. And I have friends here, friends who smack of greatness, who are en route, I would say. There are many within the Providence borders who have an understated greatness, who are en route. That is what I think on some days. Ting, ah, my rampageous life will be very possible here in Providence among all of these friends en route. And then the next day I wake up and sniff the air it has a suspicious smell. The air is wet today in Providence, unseasonably warm for winter. It has the smell of the desquamated leafy matter one unearths in the playground sandbox on the first day of spring. What does this smell mean? I know that the smell of an angled early morning sun on eucalyptus trees means greatness. That is the smell of West Hollywood. I know the smell of snow mixed with car exhaust and marijuana, the smell I remember from Tompkins Square Park. That is greatness. The smell today in Providence though, I worry it is the smell of good enough, of quality of life, of <laughs> other priorities, of wistfulness, of a shrug. What if Providence is mediocrity? Yes, we have seven hills here, like Rome. That is a fact my grandfather loved to intone, but for practical reasons, we, the municipality, have raised two of them. Practical reasons should no, not ever take precedence over greatness. I had to pretend to be a man in order to say that, but I did just say it. <laughs> I did, and now it is a new day, a new week in fact, and there's another bread bag awaiting its reincarnation. To the cat litter box I go. Hello, now I'm back. And I take up Providence again. I am by my, in my chair by the window, and I notice that each edifice on my block has been allotted exactly one tree. What if it is a question of modesty? What if the ting, tomorrow, tomorrow, is a sober reminder. All the tall buildings will someday fall. But my fixed point, no, it's books. Books or I will float away. Nothing has meaning, the days are a pantomime. So maybe the buildings will fall, but books? If it is a perversion for me to object like this, so be it. And Wittgenstein's mistress? In that book, the world is gone, fallen. And by world, I mean people, people great and small. And the museums are a fire, and yet the great art is still all around. There's art and there are books and the woman, maybe the last left, she is there to see and read. She is there to continue the great chain. And so what if the critics and the book reviewers and the servers powering all the online chatter are gone? Great things once made will not disappear. Of great things once made, even if then lost, burned in a fire, something remains. This all seems 
quite a callow counterpoint, actually. And in fact, I haven't read Wittgenstein's Mistress in nearly 20 years now. And here I am. Oh, and Wittgenstein's Mistress and Wittgenstein's Mistress. But I still haven't completely grasped why he called the book that. Or once I did grasp it, I read Tractatus until it got too mathy. And I underlined the feeling of the world as a bounded whole is the mystical. And I, un and I connected to it that very day to Wittgenstein's Mistress. Now the connection is gone. I would do well to find it or another one or simply read the book again, but back to modesty. Modesty first and providence, the ting. What is a modesty is not about the ephemeral nature of greatness. For after all, we here are all living with the knowledge that our civilization itself, and by that I mean our culture, our way of life may soon be irrelevant because while other cities and neighborhoods may be or are now flooded or flamed, this modest little mid-sized city, its roads and sewers and trash, all our municipal services and the banks and the park service, they will chug along well past the time that they matter. The modesty here is about the quiet. Your greatness is your own business here. By greatness, do I mean, do I just mean your work? I was ordering a book at the library reference desk last week, last week while holding my two-year-old nephew. He and I were bedecked in winter gear and sweating the reference librarian, the word pincer comes to mind, held my card and looked at her screen and said my name aloud and then said, aren't you the poet? What a dream, not even a poet, but the poet. <laughs> and a lady was behind me in line to hear it all. Did she hear it? No, she was more interested in my nephew. As a matter of fact, so was the librarian. He does have a tender and sweet disposition. If I had been the lady behind me or the librarian, would I have kept the conversation going? Would I have kept talking about poetry? I'm always so eager to. I wanted to ask the librarian, who must have been, are you also a poet? Are you nobody too? But at the library, my church, even there, I am reminded that it is improvident to write for anything or anyone but the future. If the work be great, I will know when I am dead. But babies, babies are the kind of greatness we can care about today. Seeing a baby, it's a little spasm of the soul. And my sister's child is like she is, very quiet. It will move you how quiet he is. And it is so good to be quiet. Who has ever been better for being loud? That is not exactly what I mean by greatness. Whoever can feel right, if he places value on the tokens of respect and the distinctions conferred by the world. That is what Jakob von Guten said in the book that I'm reading now. I carry it everywhere. It is not with much difficulty that I go about my days with kids and cats. Fairly easily do I walk around Providence. It's only due to this resolve of greatness that I also carry gingerly in my left coat pocket, the one without the hole, that I feel heavier than I should. Or do I feel lighter? A few nights ago, the snowplow pushed the cover off the sewer grate. The municipality was in danger. Anyone could have fallen through. I crouched in the snow and heaved the cover. Heaved is not the right word. Well, from here, the story gets less exciting. I had to call down the street for a midnight dog walker to help. Together, we recovered the hole. I told a lot of people this story of how I saved the city. The incident lasted approximately 12 minutes. I write every day for much longer, but would never dare say so. If pressed, I lie. What did you do this morning? Meetings, oh, so many meetings, grading, lots cleaned. It happened that for dinner on the sewer cover night, I had eaten an enormous amount of garlic. I almost didn't call on the dog walker to help. I almost walked away. The garlic was embarrassing and leaking out of me into the cold air. Eat what becomes you and stay silent. I did not breathe while we moved the cover. <laughs> Providence really is the ideal city to pursue, always pursue and never possess greatness. We are much luckier here because it is quieter and no one cares about our work. There are no grand cocktail parties in my apartment and when great people do pass through the city and someone hosts them, I'm thankfully not invited. If someone here were to host a party for say Hilton Owls, I would beg not for an invitation, but to be the coat check girl. There is no age limit for coat check girls and the right kind of lipstick against my whitening hair will instill around me an aura of bathos, perhaps a kind of Daffy Betty Davis look, I know I could pull off and I'm sure it would be all akimbo and that will draw Hilton to me. And we will meet not as equals, 
which would not nurture the secret greatness in my own coat pocket, but as teacher and student. I will always be the student and I will always live so deeply in Providence that when a rare stray young person wants to seek me out, they will not find me. I have one last thing to say. It is silly and deeply serious. Why do I describe the nature of what I am saying? It's because I don't know how to begin. Small then, I'll begin with lichen, the crustose lichen that grows on cemetery gates. Up close, yes, let's go very close to the gates. It looks like flakes of snow, this lichen. When I say I'm going deeply into Providence, I also mean into the ground, into a grave. Very definitely the body there is only bone by now. And here he is, my great love. His name is Brian, which is not the name I would have chosen for a great love, but perhaps that proves that he is real. He was real. Well, he still is. I don't mean he's a ghost. Brian was the first great person I met. And this meeting happened when I was a teenager and he was also a teenager. He was also the first person to speak to me of greatness, of providence in the divine sense. And his voice when he spoke, it was like someone feathering with fur on a bear's back. That made a sound, that sound would be Brian's voice. He has been dead for 30 years, exactly 30 years. And when I want to, I can still hear his voice. When he was alive and 17 or 18 and I 14 or 15, I was frightened of him. I loved his voice and to be near it, but not too near. I wrote a catalog of great things that he did when alive. So many great things and the words picked slowly. I mean, over many years, a catalog I collected over 30 years. And just now I've erased it. Everybody else give the poets another round of applause. Poets will be signing copies of their books. Thank you for coming. If everyone could please move your chair so I can get to the wall, I'd be grateful. <laughs>